Hello and welcome back to the YouTube series for Intro to Circuits. Today, as you might already have concluded, we are going to be talking about KVL, KCL, and we are going to use them to put together a method for analyzing circuits known as the branch current method. But before we get into the branch current method, as I just mentioned a moment ago, we need to talk about KVL and KCL. If you remember from the last video, we derived, or we didn't really derive, I gave you this formula here for KVL. Let's get a bigger highlighter. There we go. And this one for KCL. And we're going to talk about what these mean, what each of these means. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So let's start with KVL. So KVL is Kirchhoff's voltage law, and it states that the sum of all voltages in a loop are equal to zero. So let's see what Kirchhoff meant by that with this example drawn below. If I take the sum of all of the voltages in this closed loop here, and just as a reference, a loop means a set of components where you end where you began, at least by a loose definition. Let's go ahead and see if we can add up all these voltages and see what they amount to. We can use this principle to find this guy right here, this V out. Let's go ahead and see how we're going to do that. So I'm going to start down here in the bottom left-hand corner, and the first thing I see here is a minus sign, and that's with a 10-volt source. So we're going to put minus 10 down here. And then I'm going to continue on, and then I, oh, I see a plus sign, and a 3-volt source here. So let's do plus, or excuse me, a 3-volt dissipation there. So plus 3. And now let's go on, and I see another plus sign, and then the value is V out. So let's do plus V out, and then we drag the arrow back to where we started. So once we get back to where we started, it's equal to zero. So now you can use algebra to rearrange this, and you can say that V out is equal to 10 minus 3 which is equal to 7. Of course, that's in volts. Pretty straightforward, I think. Now let's talk about a, another law of Kirchhoff's, his current law. Now I mentioned some other names for these last time. This right here is the loop rule. And KCL is the node rule. So a node is a connection between two or more components. When we do circuit diagrams, we indicate a connection of more than two components through a dot. A connection of just two components can be made by an ideal wire. This right here just indicates a splice in that wire. Now the KCL formula here looks a little different but we are going to express it the same way. So the sum of all of the currents coming in to the node must be equal to the currents leaving the node. So in this case, let's say I had 10 amps here. We'll call this one I out, and we're gonna call this one four amps. Let's apply KCL here and see what happens. So this is our node. And let's write the currents going in. We have 10 amps. And that is going to be equal to the currents leaving. So this is going to be 4 plus I out. If I algebraically rearrange this, we get 10 minus 4 equals I out which is equal to 6 amps. Pretty straightforward. Now, the other way that we can express this and the way that I will show you how to express this uh, when we get to the node voltage method in the next video is I will say the, the sum of the 
of all currents entering or sum of all currents entering a node and remember that currents entering so let's say i n currents leaving are just negative currents entering so we can say minus let's say let's assume that currents leaving are going to be positive we'll establish that convention next time so so i out minus sum of i in is equal to zero and this is how we will express that in the next video but i just wanted to give you both give you all a, a brief introduction to kvl and kcl because we will be applying these concepts in circuits today so let's generalize this into a method a set of steps that we can follow a recipe if you will that will allow us to successfully analyze circuits each and every time we take a look at one. So first and foremost, I'm going to go through the steps as I have them written out here. Um, of course, just seeing a set of steps mean, doesn't mean a whole lot without some examples. So I have some examples um, set up for us to go through after this. But let's go through the method first, and I'd like to talk a little bit about each of these steps. So, step one, assign polarities to all circuit elements. Now, notice I used the word assign in front of polarities, not find the polarities, assign polarities. One of the key things to know is that you have the choice of which direction the plus and minus sign go on a component. And this might sound crazy, but if you... If you choose the plus and minus sign, let's say I had a resistor up here, and I choose this to be my polarity. If the current is flowing in this direction, the magnitude of this will be positive, so this will be plus V. But if the, the current is still going to enter from that side of the resistor, regardless of how I rearrange these signs, the only difference is now this is going to be minus V. So if you change the polarity, the only thing that's going to happen is a negative sign is going to go out in front of it to let you know that the polarity in actuality is opposite in direction to which you defined it. So there's no worry about defining a plus or a minus sign the wrong way. The magnitude of that value will even itself out. So remember that you are to assign the polarities. It's up to you how, you how you put them in there. Next, we have to determine the minimum number of variables with the backyards formula. Now, I will, I'll show you what a backyard is when we get to the next example. Um, essentially, a backyard is any closed loop, and there can be multiple in a circuit back-to-back. -back. So imagine if we had this circuit and then we had another couple of boxes out here of unknown circuit elements, unknown passive circuit elements, that is, um, out here in a loop connected to this one, then you would say you'd have a backyard here and you'd have a backyard here. Now the formula is written down here, and I suppose I should highlight it. That way you can find it easily. Let's go ahead and do that. So the formula is the number of variables is equal to the number of backyards minus the number of current sources in the circuit. Now, why, would, why, is, why does this have anything to do with current sources? Well, current sources do have a voltage across them, but we, we can't really relate that, um, that voltage to current with Ohm's law because we don't really know what the ideal current source is representing. An ideal current source is just a way for us to to analyze a circuit. It could be a, a sum of various different components or the output of a power supply, that kind of deal. So we can't, we don't know what the resistive value of that component is just based off of the ideal source. So when we do KVLs, we want to avoid current sources. So again, just to reiterate, number of variables is equal to the number of backyards minus the number of current sources. Keep that in mind. That will help you determine the number of unknowns you have versus the number of equations you need to find. Now, step three, label all currents in the circuit. 
Now, when you label currents, it's important to do this with known values and only use variables where you absolutely must to make your life a lot easier. If you only need to, to find one variable, there's no need to have three. It just makes your life that much harder. Step four, apply KVL where needed. And I suppose I should also say um, that when you are doing, when you are labeling all your currents in the circuit, you may have to intuitively use KCL. And we'll go over that in a little bit. But you'll apply KVL where needed to write your equations. And then step five, answer the question. This is probably the most important part right here is to answer the question. I, a, lot of, a lot of the time, you'll be sitting there taking an exam in engineering school, and you'll be like, okay, cool, I can do KCL, I can do KVL, and then you'll completely forget to answer the question afterwards. You'll, you will have found all the circuit elements and have wasted your time. So please remember to answer the question. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take a, a look at our first example to see how all of this kind of fits together. So step one, let's assign some polarities. Well, I see some resistors here. Now I'm going to go ahead and put a plus and minus sign around this, and I'm not going to label it. But right now, all you need to do is just put a plus and minus sign over each circuit element. So I'm going to do them all the same way. Plus sign here, minus sign here, plus sign here, minus sign here, plus sign here, minus sign here. Let's get rid of these. Um, let's get rid of those arrows. We'll come back to that. Believe it or not, I had to solve this circuit to be prepared for this video to so that I could uh, so I could make sure I wasn't showing you anything too, too crazy. Make sure the values check out during the video. So those arrows were there preemptively. All right, so do we have polarities over all the circuit elements? I think we do. Now with voltage sources, you should, as a general rule of thumb, apply the polarities in the same configuration as the value that's given, or as, as the component that's given. All right, step two, let's determine the minimum number of variables. So, I'm only going to need one variable because I have a backyard here, a backyard here, but a current source here. So I have two backyards. So let's see, number of variables is equal to two backyards minus one I source, which is equal to one unknown. So that's our formula there. So we found the number of variables we're going to need to solve this circuit. So let's label all the currents in the circuit. Well, we have a two amp current source here. So we know that going into this node down here, we're going to have two amps. We also know there are going to be two amps flowing here. Well, what current is going to be flowing during out through this branch? What direction is it going to be going? It doesn't matter. We can, in the same way that voltages, we get to assign the polarity. We get to decide that we get to um, define the direction of currents. In the same way, it will even the magnitude will even itself out with a negative sign if need be. Let's go ahead and put an arrow up here, and we're going to call this guy I1. So there's our one variable. Now, is there a way that we can write this current here going through the, flowing through this branch in terms of just the currents we've already labeled? We know that we only need one variable. Take a second to see if you can think of a way to do that. If you said apply KCL, you would be absolutely correct. So let's go ahead and draw our arrow here. Now we are going to define this. Let's say this is I2 for now. 
Now let's write an equation that describes I2. Well, we have the sum of the currents in entering a node, so that's I1, is equal to the number of currents leaving a node, or is equal to the value of the sum of the currents leaving the node. So I2 plus 2. So if we rearrange this algebraically, we have I2 is equal to I1 minus 2. So instead of I2 up here, because that's a pretty simple equation to be able to come up with, you could probably do that in your head with some practice. Let's go ahead and just erase this I2, and we're going to go ahead and define this as I1 minus 2 amps. And that's the current flowing through that branch. But I will leave this here. Now, let's go ahead and say KCL top. Because when we do KVL or KCL, it's important to write what we did and where we did it. So that's our KCL top. But this one right here is trivial. It's a pretty straightforward thing to, d to do. So now, next up, we, I think we've labeled all the currents. So we can now say it's time to apply KVL where we need it. Now, I've already written out down here KVL left as you can see from when I solved this equation, or solved this circuit earlier. So, but the reason I am choosing to do KVL on the left over on this loop is because I don't want to do KVL where I have a current source. Again, because we don't know the voltage across this already, and therefore we also don't know the resistance, which means we can't use Ohm's law to establish a relationship. So let's do KVL on this left-hand loop. Now when we do KVL, we start in the bottom left-hand corner of the loop, and we drag our finger, in my case a little red dot, up until we hit the first polarity sign. In this case, it's a minus. What's the value? 50. Minus 50. Next up, I see a plus sign. But what's the voltage here? Well, I have a current coming in here, and I have a resistance value, so there's no reason I can't use Ohm's law right here. So let's say plus 10 times I1, because V is equal to I times R. So get very familiar and very comfortable with Ohm's law. All right, let's continue. Now notice I hit a plus sign first, so that's the first thing I wrote down. Moving on, I see another plus sign. I see 100 ohms and I have a current of I1 minus two. So let's do plus 100 times I1 minus two. All right, and now I can drag my cursor back to where I started. So equals zero. Now let's rearrange this algebraically. We have one equation, one unknown, just like our formula told us. So let's go ahead and solve this algebraically. So minus 50 plus 10 I1 plus 100 I1. minus 200 equals zero. So negative 200 minus 50 is equal to minus 250, and 10 plus 100 is 110, so 110 I1 minus 250 equals zero. 110 I1 equals 250, and I1 is equal to 2.2. 27 amps. Let's check that with the value that I solved before the video. Looks like we got it right. So, now 
we need to find all the voltages since we just did KVL to find our unknown. This unknown here, now that we know what it is, will allow us to solve for all of the voltages in the circuit. Notice how we used Ohm's law, this part of the Ohm's law equation to substitute here. Well, now that we know the value of I1, we can go back and we can assign voltages to all of these, all of these resistors and even the current source. So let's go ahead and do so. Now remember from the last lecture that I did, remember the passive sign convention when you label your voltages. If the current enters the plus sign, this guy is going to be positive, this voltage. If it enters the minus sign, it's going to be negative. So let's keep that in mind. So this is going to be passive sign convention. See lecture one. So now let's assign a name to each of these voltages. So let's call this V10, V100, and V25. To make our lives super easy, let's start with V25. V25 is equal to I25 times 25 ohms. Now the current through the 25 ohm resistor is 2 amps as dictated by this current source. So we know that going into the plus sign, so this is going to be positive, V25 is going to be positive, this is going to be equal to 2 times 25, which is equal to a positive 50 volts. Awesome. Next up, let's do V10. Scroll down here. V10 is equal to I10 times 10 ohms. Now, the current going through the 10 ohm resistor enters the positive terminal. It will be positive and is I1. Well, we found I1 earlier to be 2.27 amps. So this is going to be 2.27 times 10, which is equal to 22.7. And because this was a repeating number, this is going to be 72. If you want to get into sig figs and all of that, we can leave it at 7. 22.7 volts. Great. Next up, we are going to find V100. V100 is equal to I100 times 100 ohms, which is equal to 2.27, uh, excuse me, I1 minus 2 times 100 ohms, which is equal to 0 0.27 times 100, which is equal to 27 volts. Awesome. Now, there's still one component we have yet to find the voltage across, and that is this current source here. Now, this current source, we have to take a little bit of a different approach we are going to have to use the voltages that we've already found in order to find the voltage reference to ground up here. Let's go ahead and put a ground node right here to make our lives easier. So what we're going to do, so I know the value of V100 now is 27 volts, 
and I know the value of this guy is 50 volts. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go up in potential. So we go from low potential to high potential. So we're going to go up to 27 volts. So that means the voltage right here with respect to ground is going to be 27 volts. And now I'm going to go from an area of high potential to an area of low potential. And we know that the value of V25 is 50 volts. So we're going to do 27 minus 50, which I believe gives us minus 23, if I did that correctly. So let's go ahead and write minus 23 now. And you'll notice that we have a value of minus 23 up here and a minus, excuse me, a value of zero down here because ground. So that means the voltage across the current source with respect to the polarity marked on the drawing, so let's call this VI, VI is equal to minus 23 minus zero, which is equal to minus 23 volts. So now, apart from the obvious, 50 volts here, we have found all of the voltages across the circuit components. So our final answer, we'll go ahead and mark this down in green, is right here. I want a nice pretty box. Give me a pretty box, there we go. So this, these are our final answers. Now let's see if we can extend this concept to a more complicated circuit, like this one down here. So this one has a very specific set of parameters that we want to find, but we are going to follow our steps, and we are going to knock this circuit out in no time. So let's go back up to the steps. Assign polarities. Let's get started. So I am going to do the same thing. I like to follow the convention of plus sign first. Let's see, and we'll do it this way too. Okay. That might be confusing down there. Let's move those in here where the resistance is not shown. And let's do the same thing up here, minus plus. Move these down here. That wasn't supposed to happen. There we go. All right. And V2 already has a polarity, so let's ignore that. Now V1, let's, let's move that polarity for V1. That V1 polarity was defined already in the circuit. Now, that's the one thing I should say, is that if polarity is defined in a circuit, do not change it, or your answer is going to be wrong. It's going to be off by a sign. So this time, I'm going to intuitively apply KVL when I approach step number three, but before step number three, we need to determine the number of variables. So let's see, we have three backyards and one current source, so number of variables is equal to number of backyards, three backyards, minus one current source, one I source. I is the symbol for current, so we say I source for current source. This is equal to two variables. So we're going to need an I1 and an I2 somewhere in this equation. The crazy thing is that they already give us I1, which is great in this scenario. Now sometimes you are going to have some challenging problems in the sense that I1 and I2 will be placed in unconventional places. Um, and you'll have to work backwards from the normal thought process to define them. And I tried not to do that in this case. So let's see how far we can get with, um, now that we're moving on to step three with the currents. 
let's see how far we can get by defining the currents with just I1, and then we'll define I2 when we need it. So we know we have a 10 amp current source here, and we have a value I1 here. So if I put a little arrow here, we're going to have 10 amps. Now, I'm not going to write this out, but we know, I suppose I should put dots on all of these since they are connected at, as nodes. I know that the currents coming in are going to be equal to the currents going out. So I can say that this output current is going to be 10 plus I1. Now let's keep moving along in the circuit. I know that these two elements being in series are going to have the same current, and then we get to here. Well, what do we do here? We don't have a defined current in this loop down at the bottom, and we don't have a defined current here. So I say we go ahead and define a current here and a current here, and we know this is going to be 10 plus I1. Let's call this I2. And then we can say this guy out here is going to be 10 plus I1 minus I2. Seems pretty straightforward, does it not? Now, when we get to this node, our minus I2 is going to be canceled out by this plus I2. So that checks out. I1 is going to be entering this node and leaving this direction, and the 10 amp is going to be leaving in this direction, entering from this direction. So all of the currents will, at this point, split off in their appropriate directions. So we're going to have I1, going to have 10 amps, and we are going to have, excuse me, we are going to have I2. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I believe that defines all of our currents. So, step number four. Let's apply KVL. All right. So where are we going to apply KVL? Most certainly we are not going to do it here because of this current source. So... Let's go ahead and do a KVL at this loop right here, KVL top, KVL top right. So let's do, let's write it over here. KVL, what we did, where we did it, top right. All right, if we do a KVL top right, let's start in the bottom left hand corner of the loop, we hit a minus sign, so minus 10, move on to the next, and we hit a plus sign for the 25 ohm, and the current is going to be entering the positive terminal with 10 plus I1. So plus 25 times 10 plus I1. I'm going to need to move this over just a touch. Now we have the same current going through a 75 ohm resistor, which is going to be which is going to give us 75 times 10 plus I1. And then we can return back to our starting point so we can set that equal to 0. All right. Now it looks like we just have one equation and one unknown in this scenario which I think is phenomenal. So let's go ahead and solve this equation while we're at it. So these two terms here will combine to give us is 10 plus 100 times 10 plus I1 equals zero. And we can then distribute that 100. So we have minus 10 plus 1,000 plus 100 I1 is equal to 0. 
And now we can combine these two terms. We have 100i1 is equal to negative 990. So that means that I1 is equal to negative 9.9 .9 amps. All right, so that's one value that we found. Now, this particular problem asks us to find V1, I1, and V2. And I know we still haven't found I2, and I'm going to teach you a little trick. It's nice to consider steps four and five together, applying KVL and answering the question, because sometimes that will prevent you from doing an unnecessary KVL. Notice the circuit values we're asked to find are right here in a loop where we just did KVL, and then right here in a loop where we know the current. Now, it, that wouldn't have worked out. We would, still, we would have had to do a KVL down here in order to find in any of these voltages. But because we're not being asked to find these voltages, we don't have to do a KVL down there. Now, for the sake of demonstrating KVL, I'm going to go ahead and do one for you anyway. So let's do a KVL for I2. So KVL, bottom right. All right, start in the bottom left-hand corner. We hit a plus sign, a 30, and I2. I2 will be entering that positive terminal. So let's go ahead and do plus 30 I2. We know this is gonna be the beginning of our equation, so we don't need that plus sign. Next up in our loop is this voltage source with I2 entering the minus terminal, but we don't need to worry about I2. We are simulating as if we are the current in this case. So here we are, minus sign, 4 volts. So minus 4 volts. Don't need to write that V there. It might be confusing for when we have, when we have uh, voltages in our equations for KCL later. Let's finish this out. And we have a plus sign and a 60 ohm resistor, and I2 is going through that as well. So plus 60 I2 is equal to 0. Minus 4 is equal to minus 90 I2. That means that I2 is going to be positive and it's going to be 4 over 90, which I had the value down there. So let's do 4 over 90. It's going to be 44.4 milliamps. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with SI units, when you see this little M next to some SI unit, this is equivalent to saying 10 to the minus 3. So this is really equal to 0 0.0444 and so on amps. It's all the same. But milliamps tends to be how we choose to express that. Now, like I said before, we didn't need this for our problem. But now we can move on to step five and we can actually answer the question. Oddly enough, we've already answered one part of the question. 9.9 .9 amps there for I1. Now let's find V1. V1, we have 10 amps entering the minus terminal of this 20 ohm resistor. So, with that being said, V10 is equal to I10 times 10 ohms. Excuse me, that's a 20 ohm resistor. Let's get that right. 20, 20, and 20. And this is equal to, since this current is entering the minus terminal, we'll do minus 10 amps times 20 ohms, which is equal to minus 200 volts. It's quite a fair bit of voltage. Crazy what happens when you have a 10 amp current source running through a circuit. Now we mentioned that we already found I1 earlier, so we can go ahead and write I1 down. So that's equal to nine, negative 9.9 .9 amps. 
Now, up here, V2 is across this resistor, and we need to find V2. So we have 10 plus I1 entering this plus terminal of a 75 ohm resistor. So I didn't need to do that. Let's say V1. Now let's do V2 is equal to I75 times 75 ohms. Now this is going to be equal to 10 and I believe that was plus I1, so 10 plus negative 9.9 .9 times 75, which is equal to 0 0.1 times 75 is equal to 7.5 volts. And that right there is your answer to the problem. I'll close out the video by saying there are plenty of examples online that you can find of people doing tutorials about their individual methods of KVL, KCL, and however, whatever conventions they've established. It is, however, important to note that you should be doing whatever method you are most comfortable with. And of, of course, there's a hundred different ways to solve a problem, but the crazy thing about circuits is it's like solving a puzzle. Um, you can lay out a hundred pieces on the table and sure, everybody is going to put the puzzle together a different way, but it becomes more routine when you have a certain order, a certain method that you establish to achieve your goal. So this is the method that I was taught and it works every time if you follow the method. So I highly encourage you to practice this method. And speaking of practice, that's the only way you're going to learn how to do this kind of thing. I'm sitting here doing this for the bajillionth time in college, and I hope that each and every one of you watching this video will find yourselves in the same situation, hoping to do something pretty great with the tools that you're learning from these videos one day. So, um, apart from that, practice, practice, practice. Next video, we're going to be talking about the node voltage method for circuit analysis. It is a another tool that we have in our tool belt as electrical engineers, and it does have its useful applications, particularly when you get to doing circuit analysis with operational amplifiers, which we will cover some operational amplifier circuits in this little lecture series. So... If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video, found it educational. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And beyond that, have a great day and I'll see you next time.